When we think of rockets, we think of America and Russia and their great space race. But this is the almost forgotten story of Britain's very own rocket program. It wasn't something that we'd got from the Americans, it was something that we'd done ourselves. Britain's rocket men were unsung space pioneers at the cutting edge of technology. You're generating much more power per unit volume than almost anything else on the planet. Any error could spell disaster. It was the biggest and, and the most epic explosion that's ever occurred at the range head. We've tracked down the small British team who overcame daunting odds to realize their dream and put Britain into space. In the 1950s, the world was waking up to the possibility of space travel. The Second World War had triggered all kinds of new technology, including some very big military rockets. Britain scientists and engineers were front runners in dreaming up schemes that would adapt this new rocket technology to blast mankind towards the stars. It wasn't just a technical challenge, it was what the future of the human race would be. There were thoughts that uh, our view of the whole universe might change as a consequence. Many of these visionary ideas came from members of the British Interplanetary Society. The Interplanetary Society used to meet here at the Mason's Arms pub in London's Mayfair. These were no childish dreamers, but some of the best scientific brains in Britain. As early as 1938, they'd even sketched out detailed plans to put a British man on the moon. John Scott Scott was one such enthusiastic scientist who thought it was only natural that Britain should play its part in the international race into space. There was a general feeling looking around the world, um, particularly at the Americans and the Russians, we had every bit as good a chance as the others, provided we could get some backing to do it. Unfortunately, the British government didn't share the scientists' enthusiasm for space travel. Well, the government didn't have scientists and engineers in it. It didn't understand it, had other problems. So when proposals were made to the government, they tended to met with a very lukewarm attitude. All ministers cared about was using space rockets for military use. The 50s marked the start of a Cold War between Russia and the West. Britain's politicians asked the companies that had helped with World War II to develop nuclear missiles which could drop warheads on Moscow. But as the Americans had discovered, rocket science wasn't easy. Their early attempts often ended in disaster. Even their most successful rocket of the era, the Redstone, failed on 47 of its 100 launch attempts. In 1955, Britain began to build its first space rockets. The site the rocket men chose to test their new machines was a peaceful clifftop on the Isle of Wight. They built a state-of-the-art test facility overlooking the Needles. Electromechanics enthusiast Derek Mack was one of the team hired to design, build and launch Britain's first space rockets. He found himself working right at the cutting edge. Technologies were fairly basic. Um, the transistor had only just come on the scene. Digital systems were a pipe dream in the future. So we were at a pioneering stage of this sort of work. Whilst the Americans and Russians had built rockets driven by a mixture of liquid oxygen and hydrogen, our pioneering British rocket men decided to take a chance on a very different fuel system with a chemical that can be found in any hairdressing salon. The scientists had been fascinated by this stuff, hydrogen peroxide, the source of the platinum blonde. It looks like water. In fact, it almost is H2O, except it has an extra O. It's H2O2. And believe me, that extra oxygen atom makes this into a super fuel. The hairdresser's version is only 15% pure. The rocket men's was concentrated to 85%. Far more powerful stuff. Watch what happens when the hydrogen peroxide reacts with this catalyst. <laughs> Look at that! 
it explodes into superheated steam. It has wonderful properties. In fact, it's, it's almost an engineer's dream. By adding kerosene to the superheated steam and oxygen, our rocket men believed they had found the cheapest and simplest possible method to blast Britain's first rocket into space. You're generating much more power per unit volume than almost anything else on the planet. In 1958, after three years of development, the Brits headed to the vast open spaces of Australia to see if their innovative rocket would work. Black night, Britain's first space rocket had its cables released and was all set for the takeoff. To the team's delight, their military test was a huge success and many more perfect launches followed. We had a vehicle that worked. It was simple, it was cheap. It wasn't something that we'd got from the Americans. It was something that we'd done ourselves. Ultimately, 22 Black Knights tested here, blasted off successfully from Woomera, with only three failures, making it one of the most successful rockets of all time. But despite this early triumph, the government abandoned their plans for a military rocket. The politicians decided to buy new American missile technology instead, and the British program was axed. It was devastating news. With no more money from the defence budget, it looked as if British rocket building was over. But the engineers and scientists were determined to keep their dream of space alive. They had to come up with a plan. It fired us up to look for alternative applications and, and peaceful uses. The rocket men hadn't forgotten the non-military space proposals of the British Interplanetary Society. And one of its most significant ideas had been dreamt up by a very famous member, the science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke. In a 1945 edition of the magazine Wireless World, Clarke had suggested the development of satellites stationed high in space to revolutionize international communications. The Americans and Russians saw that Clarke's geostationary hovering satellite idea could transform everything from telephone calls to television and navigation. They'd already begun to use their rockets as satellite launchers. But our heroes didn't see why this British idea should be left to the foreign superpowers. We were proud to be British, and we wanted the government to produce a British satellite launching vehicle with a British-made satellite with the British-made experiments in it. Out came the slide rules and the draftsman's pens, and proposals for a British satellite launching rocket began to take shape. It was a last-ditch attempt to save their rocket program. But the government wasn't keen. Suddenly, one of the ministers openly criticised all the proposals that were being made and said that they could see no case for a commercial, i.e. non-military, space system of any sort. I don't think the Chancellor Exchequer thought about it at all. If he did, for five seconds, it was, sounds like a good idea, don't spend any money on it. But the team weren't asking for much money. They already had their simple and hugely successful hydrogen peroxide-driven space rocket. They claimed they could adapt it for next to nothing. They proposed to create a small space rocket, 13 metres high, and built in three disposable sections. The first stage would launch over 18 tonnes of rocket and fuel up to around 35 miles. Then the second stage would blast into action, roaring up to 365 miles. Finally, a small solid fuel motor would take over to propel the rocket's precious cargo, a satellite about as heavy as me, the last 20 miles into its permanent orbit above the Earth. And they called their cut-price satellite launcher Black Arrow. In space terms, it was a trivial amount of money. The Black Arrow was really a way of getting into the satellite business on the cheap. And it worked. Enough small change was found to get things going, and the British space rocket program was back in business with a tough new mission, to blast a satellite into orbit on a British rocket. Satellite launching represents the ultimate challenge. And so there was great enthusiasm from every quarter. Everybody could get up and get going and get on with the job now. But building this space rocket on the cheap was fraught with danger. 
the Americans already knew that failing to get things right had explosive consequences. But their billion dollar programs could survive disasters. Britain's rocket men had a shoestring budget. If they suffered a similar catastrophe, it could kill their program altogether. By 1969, the Americans and Russians had spent billions of dollars on their space rockets. The Apollo astronauts were about to make their first trip to the moon. British hopes were pinned on Black Arrow, the low-budget satellite launching rocket which was preparing for its very first test launch at Woomera in the Australian desert. On the 28th of June, 1969, Derek Mack and his colleagues took their seats in the control room. This launch would be the first of just three planned test flights before Black Arrow would perform Britain's first satellite launch. The preparation had been a long, drawn-out process, and so the launch was uh, the culmination of all this effort. Here we were at last now for the first try to launch it. The last-minute checks were complete. The countdown for this crucial first test launch was underway. We're at item 255700, Bill. I could only like it to like a live stage show, I should imagine, where it had to be right on the night. Rank 15, gun one. At 8.28 a.m., everyone in the control room held their breath. Launch initiated. Everything's in slow motion. You, you just see it hang there and slowly lift away, and these great shock diamonds are coming out of the jets, which is characteristic of that type of engine, and it slowly climbs away. But seconds later, as he watched the data being beamed back from the rocket, Derek Mack realized that something had gone terribly wrong. The carcass of the rocket was actually rolling backwards and forwards about its longitudinal axis. Instead of the eight diamonds coming down together, you could see flickering going on on one side. And you thought, jeeps, you know, <laughs> what's happening out there? Some of the launch crew ran outside to get a better view of the unfolding drama. And what they saw horrified them. Black Arrow was no longer climbing. It started to tumble, and the engines had stopped burning. And so I immediately thought, jeepers, you know, we want to get back in the equipment centre because she's coming down. The rocket had turned upside down, and almost 16 tonnes of highly explosive rocket fuel was heading straight back at them. We nearly got trampled on sort of going back into the equipment centre. Then we slammed the door shut. To prevent an inferno on the launch pad, the range safety officer took a critical decision. The whole ground lit up. It was the biggest and, and the most epic explosion that's ever occurred at the range head. When we went outside, there was all this sort of uh, bits of debris floating around and coming down, and all the telegraph wires were festooned with what you could liken to Christmas decorations in the sense they were fine filaments uh, uh, glistening and essentially it, it was just a uh, molten and streamed aluminium which was uh, streamed out in long thin veins where it had all melted up there and got blown apart in a, in a fairly high velocity explosion. The cause of this enormous disaster was the failure of a single control circuit that made the rocket swing wildly out of control. One tiny copper wire had destroyed years of hard work. I'd lived with this piece of hardware for a long, long time. I knew virtually every part of it personally. And um, to see it sort of totally destroyed in such, in such a big way was a terrible blow. Obviously, there was a sense of complete disappointment and devastation, which they had to wash away with countless amounts of beer for several days until they felt better. It was the worst possible start. The failure of Black Arrow's first test launch was a miserable experience for the team. But far worse, it threatened to undermine the credibility of their entire satellite launching project. It wasn't a disaster in a technical sense, it was a disaster in a political sense. It was potentially a killer. The whole program could die because 
it hadn't worked as advertised. This very public failure was just the excuse civil servants here at the Treasury in London needed to get their knives out. Cuts had to be made, they said, and there were excesses on the balance sheet, like this hopeless satellite launcher that the country simply couldn't afford. Black Arrow and the future of the British space programme hung in the balance as never before. Eight months after that calamitous first test, the team launched a second test rocket successfully. But then in September 1970, disaster struck once again. The third and final test rocket failed to reach the right altitude, and instead of putting its dummy satellite into orbit, it hurled it into the sea. This time, the Treasury knives were sharpened and ready for action. A full inquiry was ordered into why they'd all gone so terribly wrong. And when the cause was identified as a faulty valve starving the engines of fuel, there were calls for a total redesign. It was just the ammunition the Treasury needed to demand the programme was shut down. There was nobody with any power that was supporting us in, in either government, or in the civil service, or even in the aircraft industry. Nowhere was there a high-level champion who saw this as um, important uh, for the UK, important for its technology and important for um, waving the flag and showing that we were capable of doing it. But Black Arrow's test program was now complete and the team believed they'd solved their technical problems. In July 1971, Black Arrow was ready to carry out its ultimate mission the UK's first ever satellite launch. But then, the unthinkable finally happened. On the 29th of July, just as the final Black Arrow was already on its way to the launch pad in Australia, Britain's Minister for Aerospace, Frederick Caulfield, got to his feet in the House of Commons and made the announcement the rocket men had been dreading. It was all over. The Black Arrow was cancelled. That might have been the end of Britain's journey into space, but our rocket men weren't giving up. The final Black Arrow had safely arrived in the Australian desert, along with the satellite it was built to launch, called Prospero. And there was just enough money left over to light the blue touch paper. They had a beast out in Woomera, ready to go. The thing was cancelled and they said, we didn't hear that, we're going to fire the damn thing. Everyone took their old places in the control room for Black Arrow's final countdown. The team was still hoping that the politicians' minds could be changed. This launch mattered to me because it had been cancelled, this programme. And the one way to really show them what we could do and were capable of was to have a successful launch and place a satellite into orbit. And we were dead intent on doing that. At 1.39 p.m. on Thursday the 28th of October, 1971, Black Arrow faced its ultimate challenge. She was lifting slowly away. I looked back at the telemetry system and everything seemed to work perfectly. It all, all flew away straight and serenely. It was just copybook. Technical data coming back from the rocket told them that each stage had worked perfectly. But it couldn't tell them whether the satellite had been successfully deployed. All the men could do Confirmed. was wait. We knew there was a third stage firing. Was it pointing in the right direction? Had it spun up? All the rest of it, we didn't know. Across the world, listening stations were tuned in, hoping to pick up a signal from the new British satellite. 39 minutes later, the bleeps were picked up in Fairbanks, Alaska. Prospero was in orbit. Black Arrow had successfully performed Britain's first ever satellite launch. There was just great carnival going on. And everybody had thick heads the next morning. <laughs> but of course, realisation started to settle in. That, that was the end of it. Despite the best efforts of the politicians, it was a tremendous achievement. Look at this, look at the, um, the accuracy with which we could do something. 
Why on earth are they sending all of us to the tip? Why can't they use our uh, experience? Why, why can't they use us? Having demonstrated Albert and kept faith, if you wish, we could not at all understand how it came to be cancelled. And that, nobody's ever explained that one satisfactorily. I suppose there was a, a lurk in the back of your mind that uh, maybe somebody would have the willpower to sort of come out and say, well, look, you know, give them another chance. But uh, it never happened, of course, did it? The politicians never did change their minds. Instead of our backroom heroes getting a pat on the back and a fat check, the man from the ministry came down to the test site here on the Isle of Wight, locked the gates and shut off once and for all any British dream of rocketing into space. Because we got out of the business, the French took leadership within the space business within Europe. We might have had still a European programme, but it would have been a British-led European programme, not a French-led European programme. But to this day, every hundred minutes, 385 miles above our heads, a very special satellite still flashes across the sky. Prospero's days of active service may be over, but it remains as a lasting testament to the determination of those who dreamed of putting Britain into space. Next tonight on History, the search for the Atocha and a total of $600 million in sunken treasure. A worthwhile day's work for the deep-sea detectives, if they can find it.